Good morning. morning. We are on a journey toward a meal together. For some of you, you may be having a family meal on Easter Sunday or maybe Palm Sunday or another day around Easter. For our church family, we are on a journey toward the love feast or what some have called the agape meal. This meal will take place the Thursday before Easter called Maundy Thursday. It will be at 7 p.m. at the Nettle Creek Church. Last week, I talked about how our first step in getting ready for the meal is to clear the table. I talked about how we need to remove some things in our lives and replace them with spiritual practices to help us draw closer to God and closer to others. That practice of removing food or removing something else in your life and replacing it with a spiritual practice is called fasting. The church has set aside 40 days for this period of time of fasting. It is called Lent. So last week I cleared various things from the table. I cleared out things like food and chocolate and noise and screen time and Elvis. And I ended with putting a Bible on the table to help us remember that we need to replace it with more of hearing from God. And putting a devotional on it so we can have some time in the devotionals. And I put a pen and a pad of paper to help us to think about journaling during this season and the things we might be learning from God or the things we might want to talk to God about. So this week I'm going to clear these things back off and we are going to begin to set the table. Because as you're preparing for a meal, of course the food needs to be prepared, but you also need to have the table prepared and set for having the guests over and the table ready for the meal. So I'll put the tablecloth up, and then we'll put the plates. And of course, we put our forks on the left, spoons on the right, knives in between. Did I get that right? Anybody know? Okay. I looked it up on the internet. That's what they said to do. And then you put your cups out. So we've got our table set, ready for having the meal when the guests arrive. Now there's all kind of physical preparations that need to be made when you're having a meal. But this meal is a significant meal, the love feast, because it is also a spiritual meal. And so as a spiritual meal, we need to prepare ourselves spiritually for the meal. And this has come to be known in recent years in our uh, practice of the love feast as the examination. In previous years they had what was known as a preparation service. So today we're looking at this idea of the examination and when I heard the term examination one time it just hit me funny when uh, Deacon was talking to me one time and said where are we going to have the examination and where's the examination going to take place? And all of a sudden, I pictured myself in a doctor's office <laughs> with someone with a white coat and taking my blood pressure and using a stethoscope to examine me. Well, we're not doing a physical examination. And then for students, you might think about an uh, exam in your class, as we just talked about today, the tests that are coming. And you need to pass those examinations in order to move forward. So today, we're talking about a spiritual examination. And that comes from 1 Corinthians 11, 27 through 29. If you look at it again, in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty seven, 27, it says, So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, and some versions might say unworthily, will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. So we really need to find out what this unworthy manner is. Or what's unworthily, so we're not guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. In order to do this, the next line says, everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. So this is a pretty serious thought here. And Paul, in writing to the Corinthian church, is writing with seriousness to them. And he goes on in verse 30 to say, that is why many among you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep or died. So this practice that they were participating in was not resulting in good things. In fact, they were actually being judged for their practice of the Lord's Supper. 
And so some, in reading this section of Scripture, have become fearful. And it's good, I think, to have a healthy respect or a healthy reverence for what you're taking part of. But I also don't want it to become an unhealthy fear or an inappropriate fear. So today I want to talk about this. What is the worthy manner? What is approaching the bread and cup worthily all about? Because communion, the bread and cup, is one of the greatest and best gifts the Lord has ever given to us. And I want to make sure that we enjoy partaking of that. I don't want it to be something that we fear. I don't want it to be something that we dread. And I definitely don't want it to be something we partake in in an unworthy manner. So we'll continue reading in verse 31 and 32, finish this thought, and then we'll go back to the beginning of the section and get some context of this. He again says, but if we were more discerning or if we judged ourselves, we would not come under such judgment. So Paul is reminding them here that you can get yourself ready for this in a right way. And then you won't have to worry about that judgment. Nevertheless, when we are judged in this way by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be finally condemned with the world. I think this is very important to understand. Paul here is making a distinction between the discipline and the condemnation. He's making a distinction between this is temporary judgment, this is for the purpose of training, of teaching, and correcting. That's what discipline is all about. God is wanting to teach, to train, and correct this Corinthian church for their way of approaching the Lord's table so they will not be condemned with the world. There is a distinction between this. Because they are being temporarily judged, they are not being eternally condemned. And he distinguishes between this. So, he's not talking about an eternal judgment, but a temporary one. Their souls are still saved by grace through faith in Jesus' blood. And the bread and the cup are the very symbols of God's grace. They're the very symbols of the body and the blood shed for us. In other words, the bread and cup are the very symbols of our redemption and the eternal judgment that Jesus took for us so that we don't have to. The very reason we partake of the bread and cup is because we recognize on our own that we're not worthy. So the unworthy manner or unworthily does not mean that you in yourself are not worthy. Again, when we come to the table, we're already admitting that we're not worthy. We're admitting, I need the body of Jesus broken for me. I need the blood of Jesus shed for me. I'm not worthy in myself to partake, which is why I come and partake. And if you think that you are worthy in your own ability, if you think you are worthy in your own efforts, then you're already going down the wrong path of how to partake. So we eat and we drink because we recognize that we're sinners. We eat and we drink because we recognize we need redemption. That is what the bread and cup are for. So if you feel unworthy for the bread and the cup, you're a prime candidate to receive the bread and the cup. If you realize you need forgiveness, if you realize you need a Savior, if you realize you need redemption, then that is a worthy manner to receive the bread and receive the cup. Because you're honoring the one who is worthy. You're honoring the one who made you worthy. And that's Jesus with His body and His shed blood for you. It's not about if you're worthy enough to receive it. In fact, when you know you're not, you're in the right place to receive it. And think about Jesus' life. Who did he often eat with when he did his eating? If you look at who he ate with in life, it was the sinners. He ate with the tax collectors. He ate with the broken. He ate with the outcasts. He ate with those in society who were deemed unworthy. They were the ones that Jesus ate with when he was here on the earth. So in a sense, he had communion with them, eating with them. And it should be the same today, that through the Spirit, when we partake in the bread and we partake in the cup with Jesus, 
We are communing with him. And in so doing, he is choosing those that society deems unworthy. He is finding the sinners. He is finding the outcasts. And he is saying, you are welcome at my table. On the other hand, who are the ones that Jesus had trouble with? Or who are the ones who didn't want to eat with him? It was often the religious leaders. It was often those who by their own efforts at keeping the law deemed themselves worthy in the sight of God. And they deemed Jesus and his motley crew unworthy. And they therefore would not eat with them. And they by their own abilities and their own efforts and their own self-perception did not eat with Jesus. And they discounted themselves from the Lord's table. So the bread and the cup is not about you and your worthiness to participate because your unworthiness makes you worthy in the sight of Jesus. The bread and the cup are about God's redemption. The bread and the cup are about Jesus' worthiness, His reconciliation. So what is the unworthy manner? What is eating unworthily? We're going to go back to 1117 now. And we're going to see a little bit of this context here. Paul says in the following directives, I have no praise for you. Earlier in chapter 11, he praised them for remembering some of the teachings and traditions he gave them. Here he says, I have no praise for you. For your meetings do more harm than good. In the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you. And to some extent, I believe it. This division is a common thread through the whole book of Corinthians. If you go back to chapter 1, verses 11 and 12, it says, My brothers and sisters, some from Chloe's household have informed me that there are quarrels among you. What I mean is this. One of you says, I follow Paul. Another, I follow Apollos. Another, I follow Cephas or Peter. And still another, I follow Christ. They were divided into factions. One made Apollos their top apostle. One made Paul their top apostle. One made Peter their top apostle. One said, we're not following any apostle. We're just following Christ. And in the midst of that, they had divisiveness. They had doctrinal division, which turned into quarreling, which turned into them not allowing each other to feel like they were members of God's church. Paul picks this up again in chapter 3, verses 3 and 4. You are still worldly, for since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere human beings? For one says, I follow Paul. Another, I follow Apollos. Are you not human beings? Do you see the problem here? In this church, there is factions, divisions, jealousy, quarreling, and in chapters 5 and 6, it talks about immorality. And they are even boasting of this immorality. So this jealousy, quarreling, division, and immorality all comes together now when they come to the Lord's Supper. And if you look in verses 20 and 20 through 22, it says, So when you come together then, it is not the Lord's Supper you eat. For when you are eating... Some of you go ahead with your own private suppers. As a result, one person remains hungry and another gets drunk. So this tells me something about this setting of the Corinthian church doing their bread and cup. One is it tells me there's real wine involved. <laughs> People are getting drunk. That's probably not grape juice. So they're drinking in a way that's excessive. Another thing tells me they're probably not getting small portions. This is probably in the context of a full meal. Because some people are remaining hungry, some are eating too much, some aren't getting any of the cup, some are drinking so much they're getting drunk. Now in their day, there were Roman banqueting practices where they would line you up according to the status that you had. And those that had the best status among them 
got the choicest food and the choicest drink, and those that were in the last got whatever's left if there was any. And this is probably the setting that had been put into the Corinthian church. The Corinthian church adopting their cultural customs of saying, this group is going to go ahead first. And this group is not going to. They get whatever's left. And this division, this jealousy, this quarreling, this immorality, all gets pulled in now in what's supposed to be a celebration of the Lord's Supper. So Paul says, don't you have homes to eat or drink in? Or do you despise the church of God by humiliating those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you for this? Certainly not in this matter. When some people are eating a lot and getting drunk and some people aren't getting anything, this has nothing to do with how the Lord's Supper is supposed to be celebrated. He said, you've turned this into what your culture does and how you feast together. This is not a love feast. This is not an agape meal. This is not a worthy way to honor the Lord with the bread and the cup. And because of that, they're getting judged. So now verse 23. He reminds them what this is all about. Verse 23. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Whenever you drink it, drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Paul was reminding them what this meal was all about. Paul was reminding them what this broken body and this shed blood was all about. And that Jesus was to be the primary focus. And His body was to be honored. And I think that in this, Paul is actually referring to at least two aspects of God's body. One being Jesus, the person whose body was broken and whose blood was shed. But in 1 Corinthians 12, a chapter later, Paul describes the church as the body of Christ. And I believe that in this act of eating together, he is trying to remind them that they also are the body of Christ. And that they are not correctly discerning the Lord's body. They are not correctly seeing that the body of Christ is to be in unity and in peace and in love when they come together. Not in factions and divisions and jealousy and some getting and some not. It was not about a self-indulgent party. It was not about immorality. It was not about division. It was not about ignoring certain groups. It was not about kicking out the poor or the outcasts and saying you get whatever's left. It was about making things right with God and making things right with each other. That's what the bread and cup was all about. And if anything, as the church, they should have been elevating the poor, elevating the social outcast, elevating the people that Jesus ate with, at least equally, if not ahead of themselves. That the Lord's table is a place for unity and love and peace, not division and jealousy and quarreling and immorality. And that's why Paul concludes in 33 and 34, So then, my brothers and sisters, when you gather to eat, you should all eat together, waiting for each other. Anyone who is hungry should eat something at home so that when you meet together, it may not result in judgment. He says, if it's all about you getting your food and you getting your needs met, do that at home. Because this is about love. This is about honoring Jesus. This is about serving one another. When you come together for this meal, this is a worship event. When you come together for this meal, this is a fellowship event in the truest sense of the word. This is not a meal where we're bringing our jealousy and our quarreling and our bickering and our immorality. That doesn't mean that when you come to the table, all has to be well to start with. 
But it means that when you come to the table, you're coming expecting the Lord to change your heart. Expecting the Lord to through the bread and through the cup bring that reconciliation with God and bring that reconciliation with each other. So I believe that it was in the context of a meal and I believe it was about the full dimension of relationships with God and relationships with each other. So we're not done setting the table yet. We'll bring one chair for yourself and bring another chair for somebody else because this is about coming together as the church to partake in the bread and partake in the cup because he says when you come together when you eat together wait for each other so in our time of preparing for this feast in our time of fasting during Lent in our time of examination we need to focus on our relationships with God and each other and that's why in the older days, in the Church of the Brethren, deacons would come to every member of the church and ask them a few questions before they participated in Love Feast. The first one dealt with our relationship with God, and these are in my challenges today for you, because I'd like you to take them with you. The first one is, are you still in the faith of the gospel as you declared at your baptism? Another way of thinking about that is, are things right between you and God? The second one dealt with your relationship with others. Are you, as far as you know, in peace and union with the church? Another way of thinking about that could be, are things right between you and others in the church? The third question, intertwine the two. Will you still labor with the brethren for an increase of holiness both in yourselves and in others? Another way of thinking about that would be, are you still working together with the church? so that you and others can be in right relationship with God. These are the questions I want you to personally answer this week. We're not going to have the deacons come to you and ask you these questions, but these are the questions I want you to consider. Before love feasts, these are good questions to ask, to examine ourselves, to be ready to partake in the bread, to be ready to partake in the cup. But periodically throughout our lives, there are good questions to ask. Are things right between you and God? Are things right between you and others in the church? Are you still working together with the church so you and others can be in right relationship with God? Now these are things we can confess to God by ourselves. We believe in the priesthood of all believers. And so you can, as 1 John tells us, confess your sins to the Lord. But we also know in James 5 it says we can confess our sins to one another and pray for each other so we can be healed. I think part of the benefit of the, of the deacon question was at least you had a, an opportunity to respond to another human being. I know there have been times in my lives where confessing to another person really helped me. And I needed that prayer from that other person. And that helped to bring healing into my life in ways that a private prayer to God maybe couldn't do. So I encourage you, as I talked about last week in fasting, if you have a prayer partner, if you have an accountability partner, someone you meet with on a regular basis for your spiritual journey, this may be something you might want to do with them. And just ask them, is there any way that you want me to pray for you in these three areas? Or is there anything that you want to talk about at this stage of your journey? And that might be an opportunity for you to open up and to receive the extra prayer, receive the extra encouragement that you might need in that area. And then, when you've taken the time to answer these questions, come to the table. Not because you're worthy in and of yourselves. Not because you've gotten yourself all cleaned up or gotten it all figured out. But because the table is the way that you can experience His grace. Experience His goodness. And experience His reconciliation through the body of Christ. God has called us to the table, not because we're worthy in ourselves, but because the one who called us is worthy. And His body has been broken for us. His blood has been shed for us so we can be reconciled to God and we can be reconciled to each other through the table. And in so doing, when we seek to honor God and when we seek to build unity and peace, in the congregation, we are coming together 
in a manner that's worthy of what Jesus did for us. Let's pray. God, we come to you now in the name of Jesus. We seek you, Lord. We seek you today, and we ask that you would help us to examine ourselves through the Holy Spirit. Show us our relationship with you, our relationship with others, and working with the church to build holiness in ourselves and others, God. If there are areas this week that come up, we want to confess those to you. Make it right so we can live in right relationship with you and right relationship with others. We want to participate in the bread and cup in a way that's worthy of you, in a way that's worthy of what you did, in a way that honors the body of Christ. We ask this now in Jesus' name. Amen. As